Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel for an interview you could already tell I'm very excited about. Not only do I get to talk Stranger Things 4, but I get to talk about one of my favorite shows out there with Robert Englund, of all people. When you popped up in Stranger Things 4, if only you were able to see the utter delight on my face. Congratulations. I'm so happy you're in the show. Well, thank you. And, you know, I'm a fanboy myself, and I'm, I'm really honored to be on the show. It's It's such a terrific mixture of uh, 80s nostalgia and horror and science fiction. And and uh, I'm a big fan of, of, of so many of the kids and, and David Harbour. And I have a crush on Winona Ryder. And I love Millie Bobby Brown. And I was really excited to get to work with, uh, with Natalie and with Maya, too. Oh, I can't wait to get into your collaboration with them. But I wanted to start back at the very, very beginning because I was reading that the Duffers were surprised to see your audition tape pop up when they were going through them. So many questions about that, I guess. How did you hear about the new season's Nightmare on Elm Street spin? And did you decide on your own to submit that tape? Or was that something that Carmen Cuba encouraged you to do? Well, you know, I'm not sure I know all of the details. I had... Uh, I, I misfired on an audition for season three. Uh, and uh, I, I probably went the wrong way with the character or something. And I really wanted to be on the show. I was disappointed. And uh, I got the call or the submission for um, season four. Uh, it just came through my agent. I I, I, I guess it, came, it may have my agent might might have submitted me or Carmen might have contacted her. I'm not sure which. Uh, and I, you know, crawled into my bathtub with an old bathrobe on and my wife sat on the toilet seat and filmed me with her smartphone and I sent it in and I got a pretty quick response. So uh, I think it's because I realized that I would be narrating a lot of flashback as well as um, being on camera as Victor Creel. And I wanted to kind of link it emotionally. And I've, to I've, I've played a lot of roles recently, last five, five to eight years where I'm the, you know, I'm the old priest, uh, I'm the old scientist, <laughs> I'm the old poacher. I, I tell the backstory, you know, the old, the old doctor who tells the backstory, the exposition. Uh, uh, in a movie, and I had, and I've, I've done that a lot. So I kind of saw that Victor was also bored that, res you know, carried that responsibility, and that may be what won me the role. I have so many follow ups. First, do you mind me asking which audition you misfired for in season three, and what it was about reading Victor's monologue that really clicked and felt right to you? Well, I, as I said, let me answer the second part of that question first. I. I'd play a lot of parts recently. It's a sort of natural progression uh, because I've been loyal to the horror genre and science fiction and fantasy uh, that I have matured into these roles. There's always seems to be somebody that needs to tell the backstory, the exposition. And he might be the guy at the fishing store where the kids all go into the woods, you know. It might be the old priest that knows the story of evil in the town. It might be the scientist that knows about the experiments that went on in, you know, in the hospital back in the 1940s. But I've been playing a lot of those roles. And uh, so, so that's the answer to the first, the, the second part of your question. The first part, um, I, I think they, they, they read me for the mayor. And uh, I don't know if I was supposed to read or just meet with somebody. And I drove up to Hollywood and uh, I, I, I didn't get to meet with anybody. So I read for uh, somebody on Carmen's staff. And I, I, I don't know whether they changed the concept for the role or whether I, I did a sucky audition. I know that they said to me, uh, read it like the mayor in, from Jaws. Now, that's one of my favorite character actors, Murray Hamilton, who played that role in Jaws. But so I immediately thought of the plaid jacket, you know, and sunglasses and kind of like a corrupt, you know, kind of Southern, you know, thing. And, that, and that's and that's probably not what they wanted at all. But when they said the mayor in Jaws to me, that's what I saw in my mind's eye. So I probably canceled myself out with that audition. But I was really grateful 
uh, <clears throat> when they contacted me again for season four. And that's a much better fit, Victor Creel. I imagine that was disappointing at the time, but it does feel like it was very much meant to be. I mean, the the nightmare on Elm Street echoes this season are really something special. And one thing I wanted to ask you, because like I do tend to hear a lot about artists out there trying to distance themselves from the iconic roles that they're so well known for. But you've already said you really embrace the horror community. But now on top of that, you're jumping into a project that has so many layers that feel similar to Nightmare on Elm Elm Street. So what is it about Nightmare on Elm Street and that kind of scenario that makes you feel creatively fulfilled digging back into the idea? Well, you know, I, I have such a strange career. I began, I played uh, best friends and sidekicks for 10 years in the 70s. Jan Michael Vincent, Henry Fonda, Peter Strauss, Dennis Christopher, Jeff Bridges, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was always the buddy, the pal, the sidekick. But in contemporary terms, those don't age as well. They used to back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but not any longer. They don't want old men to have old buddies. That's not a grumpy old men. That's sort of a one-off. Um, so I, I, re I realized at the end of the 70s, I was changing myself, and I started playing bad guys. And then I did, of all things, this nerdy sci-fi uh, character on TV, and it was the number one miniseries, and it was an international hit, and I, I was submitted for an Emmy, and and I thought, you know, I'm going to be typed as this sort of nerdy Dr. Spock good alien on this miniseries. I need to do something else, and in my hiatus, I did Nightmare on Elm Street, and that simultaneously also became an international hit, and uh, people finally learned my name. They put the, the name to my face. And uh, you, you can't predict a career. And I was so embraced by the fanboys and the fangirls in the horror science fiction community. And it opened so many doors for me internationally that I sort of was very, I just became very loyal to that uh, over the years. Now I've done, in the interim, I've done Disney movies and lots of other things and lots of voice work and comedy sitcoms and guest stars. But, you know, I am, I get respect within the genre uh, and I get a better payday. I'll be honest. You know, uh, if, if you see me on criminal minds or on Hawaii five O or something like that, that's a, or, or bones shows like that. That's just Robert England, the, you know, veteran actor, just a utility actor. But when you see me in, in one of my little horror movies in Europe or, or, or in, a, in America or in Canada, uh, I'm, I don't want to say a star salary, but I, I'm, I'm handsomely paid for those. So I try to, and I have the, a fan base for those. And I like to do them for the fans and for my pocketbook. <laughs> As someone who has been part of the Nightmare on Elm Street fandom since, I guess, as as old as I had to be to actually watch the movies, which is probably way too young for most, I very much appreciate all the time you put into that community because it's a very special one. Is, is that a scream mask over your shoulder? This, so this is the scream poster, but I opted for the Nightmare on Elm Street pocket tee today. All right. There's, I love the pocket There's many, many, many more where this came from. So- even with all of your experience on tons of sets over the years, what would you say surprised you the most about the reality of working on an episode of one of the biggest Netflix series ever made? Well, you know, we were at the end of COVID protocols and uh, I had seen my makeup on me in London in a bathroom. Uh, the great Barry Gower and Duncan Jarman, who did uh, Game of Thrones, they you know, invented the Night King amongst other great uh, special effects makeups. I knew they had my back and I knew what I looked like. So I was not anxious about the makeup and I knew the makeup. Uh, I was essentially blind in the makeup. I had a pinhole that worked in one eye, but I, you know, no peripheral vision. And it was very, very dark. And if I moved at all, it, it sometimes the makeup adjusted and I couldn't see at all. So I did not have to act blind. And then the other happy accident of the nature of that scene is that I'm, I'm in a cell I've been in for 20 years. Well, a blind person would know every square inch of it. They would make themselves familiar with it. I wouldn't have to walk around with my hands extended or 
tap a cane or any of those cliches. I didn't have to devote any energy to that because Victor would know his space. He would know where his bed and his chair and his desk and where the bars were. He would have had counted those paces off so many times that it would be instinctual to him. So I was freed of all of that performance energy. And I could just concentrate on the story and the emotional truth. Uh, and my only concern was linking the emotional reality of the scene that I had with Robin and Nancy to carry it over into the voiceover narration. And, and uh, we were able to do that. Sean recorded some of that double, uh, but he recorded it in the cell immediately after I did the scene so that I was still in character, which was a very smart thing for him to do, I thought. So you already mentioned that you have a lot of experience doing voiceover backstory in shows and movies. So for anyone out there who's maybe going to tackle that kind of performance for the very first time, what's like one key piece of advice that you would give them in order to make sure that they're not just conveying the information, but they're conveying it in a dynamic and engaging way, which you very much do here. I think the trick is respect the writer, respect the writer, respect the writing and trust the rhythms. But also if there's a place where you can uh, inflict a little personality, I think it's all right. You, I think it's all right to be a little judgmental sometimes because otherwise it's real easy to fall into that academic disc jockey sound. And you, you want to avoid that. I mean, the, the, the real breakthrough I found for most voiceover narration work, especially in documentaries, was Ken Burns' original Civil, Civil War. And that really, it was like, that's what I've always had always wanted to do. I'm, I'm, I would love to be invited to work for Ken Burns at some point. But I, when I heard Civil War the first time, that was what I'd always wanted to do when I had done voiceover work before. And the one place I was able to do it was a, a 70s feature film by the great John Milius called Big Wednesday, his sort of ode to, to, to surfing of, of his youth, surfing in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. And of course, John wrote the, 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 the classic scene in Jaws about the sharks attacking the sailors and everything. So you really trust John's writing and his rhythms. But I was also able, I pinched my nose a little bit and got that kind of nasal quality of a, of a young surfer, a surfer in his 30s maybe or 40s, looking back onto the wonderful years of, of late adolescence or early 20s that they all had, you know, when everything was free and easy and wonderful and sunny and endless summer. Feel like you should do some audiobook narration. I, I listen to audiobooks nonstop, yeah. and I would totally be down to have you read me a book. Uh, well, my wife's listening to Ulysses right now, uh, and I think it's like an '80s recording from uh, the Irish, the Dublin Players or the Irish Repertory Theater. She said it's great. <laughs> That's so cool. There's so much variety like that out there. I love it. I did want to bring back working with Natalia and Maya here because a big part of that scene is that, you know, they need to convince Victor to share his story with them. So was there anything about their performance in that respect and what they gave to you as scene partners that maybe pulled something out of Victor that you wouldn't have been able to access otherwise? Well, I, I didn't see how they were dressed. And they're dressed rather humorously because they're pretending to be academics, what they think academics look like. So I just heard the voices and just listened to them. And, you know, you, you, you wait for things to key on. And, and early on, Natalia has a line that really gets to me, you know, that, that it could be happening again. It could be. And this may be, I'm not certain yet, but this may be one of the denials that Victor is in. He may have suspected that there was something wrong with Henry. His wife certainly did. That, that's revealed in later episodes uh, in the season. So there was that. But the, I also knew how wonderful they are. Um, and, you know, I had watched season three uh, several times in my preparation. And one of the scenes that stuck with me in season three really charmed me. And, 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 and kind of blew my mind a little. There's a scene in the bathroom, the ugly, soiled, 
fluorescent lighting urinal of a bathroom at the mall at the end of all the chaos in the mall. And it's Maya Hawk and it's Joe Keeley coming down off of Russian psychedelics that's been, that have been given to them and they've escaped and they're exhausted and they're sitting on the floor of, of, of a public bathroom in a destroyed mall. And there's been seasons of flirting at Chips Ahoy uh, with Maya and, and, and with Joe and, and it's unrequited. And Joe is beginning to kind of become smitten with Robin. Uh, Stephen's becoming a little smitten with her and they're exhausted. And he pulls himself the bottom of the, of the stalls in the public bathroom into the stall she's in. And they're both there leaning against the sides and, 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 and she gently comes out to him. And it's just a remarkable, remarkable scene. And because I watched season three several times, I became a little obsessed with how great the acting was in that scene. And I didn't get to meet Joe to tell him how great it was, but it actually reminded me in some strange, weird way of James Dean and Julie Harris at the top of the Ferris wheel in East of Eden, just this great, wonderful scene. And I, I, you know, I, I just wanted Maya to know that, but I was so impressed with it that I, you know, she could have improvised with me. She could have done anything she wanted because I knew I saw in that scene with Joe, I saw how wonderful she was. And I've subsequently seen her work with her father and in other films. And I know how terrific she is. And, you know, and she's responsible for X amount of the comedy relief, you know, just like, like some of the other kids are and the, and the new actor on the show, um, Joseph Quinn, who plays Eddie Munson. And, and he's batting a thousand for me. He's just, you know, he's getting all it. He's landing on all his jokes just right. But I mean, they're really re extraordinarily talented kids, you know. Without um, a doubt. Exceptional yeah. ensemble here. I'll end with this last one for you. It's kind of more theorizing, but I guess, do you think that there's any hope for Victor at this point? If, you know, he eventually comes to learn the truth of what happens to his son and what's really going on in this situation, is there anything at all that'll kind of set him free? Well, well Victor's guilt is certainly about the fact that he wasn't able to save his family. Could be that he was in denial about Henry. It could be that he was, and this is the metaphor that I use, blind to what was going on. And that's why he blinded himself. Oedipus slept with his mother and blinded himself. Victor didn't see the evil in his son and it cost him his family and he blinded himself. I mean, that's an academic essay that you could turn in in film school about stranger things than Victor Creel. But, and, you know, and I use a little bit of that. Like I use a little bit of Ben Gunn for some reason came into my head from Treasure Island. Uh, the, the, the old blind man that tells Jim Hawkins, the boy, the backstory on John Silver, long John Silver. But, but I, I don't know whether it's appropriate for Victor to be redeemed. He made the terrible mistake in World War II. A baby died. A family died. He called in a, a shelling a, a, of an innocent farmhouse. And if whether or not he sensed anything wrong with his son that he could have acted upon as a strong father and stopped and prevented, you know, with, with, with the dead animals, with the dead animals or anything else. So it could have been some of that. But the other thing is that I believe Vecna has a line and it may be when, I don't know whether it's Sam or Nancy's walking in the sort of Salvador Dali uh, 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 underworld uh, uh, upside down. And you hear Vecna talking. I think it's to Nancy. And he talks about me. He says, you know, old Victor, old Billy, old grumpy Victor, you know, never got back to him. Maybe I should. I've been so, so busy. So I don't know what that means. Does he going to kill me? Uh you know, does he want to punish me uh, more uh, than I've already been punished? I don't understand what that meant or if they feel they need to pay that off. There's so many loose ends that have to be resolved in season five. You know, we've got to get Winona and David out of Russia. My God. Uh, so we'll have to see. 
But uh, I'm just so honored and happy to be part of this kind of miraculous franchise that is, uh, you know, Stranger Things. You should be very proud. I love the season thus far, but in particular, episode four is above and beyond my favorite. So huge, huge, huge congratulations. And I can't wait to talk to you again for another project. You're always such a delight and treat to talk to. All right. (laughs) Thank you. 